Hello there, welcome to World Panorama, our weekly program on major international news affairs and their impact. I'm Ashwarya Kapoor. Let us start the program with the headlines. After 17 years of war, Afghanistan on the cusp of peace. After US-led talks, the Russia hosts dialogue between Afghan politicians and the Taliban. Two sides find common ground, but Afghan president is excluded in the talks. Donald Trump calls for unity in his second State of the Union address, vows once again to build Mexico border wall that Democrats oppose, also announces next US-North Korean summit to be held in Vietnam. US President Donald Trump predicts Islamic State will lose all its territory in Iraq and Syria by next week says U.S. will not relent in fighting remnants of the extremist organization despite decision to withdraw U.S. troops from Syria. And Venezuela power struggle intensifies. President Maduro refuses to let U.S. send humanitarian aid into the country. Aid vehicles remain parked at the border. Opposition leader Guaido warns many Venezuelans are in danger of dying without international aid. This week in Moscow, Taliban held talks with Afghanistan opposition, with both sides saying that they had charted a broad roadmap for ending Afghanistan's 17-year war. The two-day talks marked the first time the Taliban officially met with high-level Afghan representatives. However, Afghan President Ashraf Ghani was excluded from the talks. Nevertheless, the talks offered a clearer view of how the Taliban see an end to the war. The Moscow meeting came as President Donald Trump signaled an increased determination to end the U.S. military presence in the war-torn country. This was an extraordinary gathering in Moscow, which witnessed Taliban leaders stand shoulder to shoulder with Afghan opposition leaders, including former President Hamid Karzai, as both sides agreed to seek lasting peace. Karzai called the insurgents his brothers, and the Taliban also hailed unprecedented talks with the Afghan politicians as very successful. This despite disagreements over women's rights and the group's demand for an Islamic constitution in the war-torn country. Today's meeting here in uh, Moscow, and it was uh, very successful and we agreed on many points and I'm hopeful that in future we can be succeeded more further and finally we can reach a solution, we can find out a complete uh, peace in Afghanistan. Principal issues and wishes were peace, stability, and Afghanistan free of foreign forces and Afghanistan free of intervention from any side. The talks in Moscow came 10 days after the United States held discussions with the insurgents in Doha. The progress in those talks led President Donald Trump to announce in his annual State of the Union address that he may be able to cut troop numbers in Afghanistan if the talks go well. In Afghanistan, my administration is holding constructive talks with a number of Afghan groups, including the Taliban. As we make progress in these negotiations, we will be able to reduce our troops' presence and focus on counter terrorism, and we will indeed focus on counter-terrorism. We do not know whether we'll achieve an agreement, but we do know that after two decades of war, the hour has come to at least try for peace. However, in both U.S.-held talks in Doha and the one held in Moscow, government of President Ashraf Ghani was not represented. No Afghan government official was invited, meaning that none of the agreements would carry any weight of implementation. The Taliban consider the Kabul administration as a U.S. puppet and refuse to talk to Ashraf Ghani.
but U.S. officials also say that ultimately there is need to get a Taliban-Afghanistan discussion. The Afghan president has vented frustration as his friends and enemies have negotiated the future of his country. He described the Moscow talks as nothing more than fantasy. I call on the Taliban to come out of the stranger's evil plans, accept the demands of Afghans and start the talk seriously with the government. Nevertheless, a beginning has been made. After the U.S. held talks in Doha, the meeting in Moscow was the first significant public contact between the Taliban and prominent Afghans in years, with the Islamist insurgents presenting more detail on some of their positions, including on women's rights. Delegates at the Moscow meet also crucially opened the door for the Afghan government to attend future talks, despite the Taliban's refusal so far to engage with Kabul. Bureau report, Rajya Sabha TV. U.S. President Donald Trump has predicted that the Islamic State terrorist group will have lost by next week all the territory it once controlled in Iraq and Syria. He said that the U.S. will not relent in fighting remnants of the extremist organization despite his decision to withdraw U.S. troops from Syria. It is noteworthy that Donald Trump's decisions to withdraw U.S. forces from Syria has prompted some criticism at home and from allies who fear that Islamic State could regain its strength. Crucial gathering in Washington. In attendance are delegates of the Global Coalition to Defeat IS. The coalition now numbers nearly 80 nations. This group was formed in 2014 after the terrorist group overran swatches of territory and went on to launch terror attacks outside the region. On Wednesday, US President Donald Trump told the coalition partners that the territory held by the Islamic State terrorist group in Syria and Iraq could be liberated as early as next week. The United States military, our coalition partners, and the Syrian Democratic Forces have liberated virtually all of the territory previously held by ISIS in Syria and Iraq. It should be formally announced sometime, probably next week, that we will have 100 percent of the caliphate. But I want to wait for the official word. I don't want to say it too early. Trump says Islamic State would be deprived of all territory by next week and sees their total rout as eminent. Trump had shocked coalition allies in December when he declared that the group had been defeated amid reports he wanted to pull out U.S. soldiers within 30 days. But he later slowed the withdrawal after several resignations from key defense officials and strong criticism from home and allies abroad. There have been worries that post-withdrawal, ICE could likely resurge in Syria, which could happen within 6 to 12 months. The coalition's hard-won battlefield gains can only be secured by maintaining a vigilant offensive against a now largely dispersed and disaggregated ISIS that retains leaders, fighters, facilitators, resources, and the profane ideology that fuels their efforts. Despite the reservations, Trump does back down from his determination to withdraw American troops from Syria. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo reassured allies that the withdrawal of U.S. troops from Syria was not the end of America's fight and called on them to recommit to permanently defeating Islamic State in Syria and Iraq. The drawdown of troops is essentially a tactical change. It is not a change in the mission. It does not change the structure, design or authorities on which the campaign has been based. It simply represents a new stage in an old fight. The drawdown will be well coordinated and our policy priorities in Syria have remained unchanged. So has IS really been defeated? Well, it has certainly lost control of most of the territory it overran, including its strongholds of Mosul in Iraq and Raqqa in Syria. However, fighting continues in northeastern Syria where the Kurdish-led Syrian forces say they captured dozens of foreign fighters in recent weeks. Under these circumstances, it is not clear 
how the US will continue the counterterrorism pressure necessary to stop IS militants from staging a comeback. Bureau report, Rajya Sabha TV. On Tuesday night, U.S. President Donald Trump delivered his second State of the Union address to a joint session of Congress. The address clocked in at 82 minutes, the longest such address by a president since Bill Clinton's 89-minute address in 2000. And urging Congress to reject the politics of revenge, resistance and retribution, Donald Trump urged the Congress to approve his nominees, spend the money for wall along the U.S.-Mexico border and stop investigating him. He also announced his second summit with a North Korean leader at the end of this month. Interestingly, in a bold statement initiated by the House Democratic Women's Working Group, dozens of women lawmakers wore white attire as a show of solidarity. On Tuesday night, U.S. President Donald Trump delivered his second State of the Union address to a joint session of Congress. This coming at a critical moment in his two-year presidency. After two years of bitter partisanship and personal attacks on opponents, President Trump called for unity and cross-party cooperation. The call for unity is significant after he pushed his party into a record-long government shutdown over border security only to give in to Democrats later. Together, we can break decades of political stalemate. We can bridge old divisions, heal old wounds, build new coalitions, forge new solutions, and unlock the extraordinary promise of America's future. The decision is ours to make. In order to push for a consensus on border wall with Mexico, Trump sought to sow fears over migrants who have fled poverty and violence in their countries, making their way to the U.S. border to apply for asylum. No issue better illustrates the divide between America's working class and America's political class than illegal immigration. Wealthy politicians and donors push for open borders while living their lives behind walls and gates and guards. One of the most crucial announcements made in address was that on the second Trump Kim summit to be held in Vietnam on 27th and 28th of February. The two met last summer in Singapore, though that meeting only led to vaguely worded commitment by North Korea to denuclearize. As part of a bold new diplomacy, we continue our historic push for peace on the Korean Peninsula. Our hostages have come home. Nuclear testing has stopped. And there has not been a missile launch in more than 15 months. Trump also called attention to his administration's efforts to rewrite trade deals with China and other nations to make the terms more favorable to the U.S. To build on our incredible economic success, one priority is paramount, reversing decades of calamitous trade policies. So bad. We are now making it clear to China that after years of targeting our industries and stealing our intellectual property, the theft of American jobs and wealth has come to an end. In his address, Trump also mentioned the record number of women elected to Congress. Abortion and the economy were other topics Trump highlighted. Overall, Trump's address amounted to an opening argument for his re-election campaign. Not surprising then that Democrats wanting to challenge Trump in the 2020 election moved quickly to attack his address, saying it lacked substance and did nothing to unite the country. However, the address had moments of laughter and even singing. Lawmakers applauded one of Trump's guests, Judah Summit, who helped liberate one of the concentration camps in Germany during World War II. They also sang Happy Birthday to Summit, who turned 81 that day. Lawmakers also erupted in cheers for former astronaut Buzz Aldrin, the second man to walk on the moon. 
ब्यूरो रिपोर्ट राज्यसभा टीवी This tense standoff in Venezuela between President Nicolas Maduro and opposition leader Juan Guaido has morphed into something far larger than a contest for power. Maduro has blocked US sent humanitarian aid from entering the country by barricading a bridge at a key border crossing. Guaido, who has declared himself interim president, however, has warned that many Venezuelans are in danger of dying without international aid. Venezuela in the grip of worsening humanitarian crisis. The power struggle in the nation between President Nicolas Maduro and opposition leader Juan Guaido has left people in doldrums. Guaido, head of Venezuela's National Assembly, declared himself interim president, saying the constitution allows him to assume power temporarily when the president is deemed illegitimate. He has secured the backing of over 40 countries, including the US and most Latin American and European nations. However, Maduro still has the support of China and Russia, and politics is now playing out at the border where Maduro has refused to let the food and medicine aid that the US has sent enter his country, saying we are not beggars, adding that there is no humanitarian crisis. The aid tractor remains stationed at a key border crossing. We know the tanks are there on the border and it is an absurd reaction by a regime we are going to do everything we can so that some of this aid gets in. Desperate Venezuelans expressed their frustrations at a border near a border city on Wednesday. They complained of widespread hunger and shortage of staple goods. Que todo esto medicamento que son los que tienen que prácticamente son los que tienen que llegar ingresar al país ya que mucha All medicine needs to enter the country because there are a lot of people dying from the lack of medicine. There aren't enough gloves or gauzes. There are small things that don't exist. Imagine the big things that are not available in the country. We need humanitarian aid for Venezuela as soon as possible. Y en sí necesitamos esta ayuda humanitaria lo más pronto posible que llegue a Venezuela. The United States imposed heavy sanctions on Venezuela's oil industry last week. looking to cut off president nicolas maduro's primary source of revenue in his state of the union address tuesday night us president donald trump raised up pressure on the embattled maduro government saying that the us stands with the people of venezuela in their noble quest for freedom we stand with the venezuelan people in their noble quest for freedom and we condemn the brutality of the maduro regime whose socialist policies have turned that nation from being the wealthiest in South America into a state of abject poverty and despair. Maduro's critics say he has led his oil-rich country into utter ruin. Its currency is useless, basic foods and medicines have disappeared, and more than 3 million people have fled, fomenting refugee crises in Colombia, Brazil and Ecuador. But a defiant Maduro has dug in his heels. He maintains control of the military and calls the Guaido-led opposition a puppet of the United States, which he says is seeking to colonize Venezuela and exploit its vast oil resources. Bureau report, Rajya Sabha TV. One third of the Hindu Kush Himalaya glaciers will melt by the year 2100. A recent study has found. The report says that even if efforts are made to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius by the end of the century, the Hindu Kush Himalaya will warm by around 1.8 degrees Celsius, leading to a third of the glaciers melting that will destabilize Asia's rivers. Hindu Kush Himalaya covers uh, 3500 kilometers across eight countries: Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Bhutan, China, India, Myanmar, Nepal and Pakistan. and is the source of 10 major river basins including the ganga brahmaputra and indus in india Alpine World Skiing Championships on in RA in Sweden. While the exciting sport is enthralling everyone, the race against climate change is very much in focus. 
Though it was a chilly minus 17 degrees Celsius as the opening ceremony started, the Swedish ski area last year experienced an average temperature that was 1.6 degrees higher than normal. I think for everybody that is used to do skiing, uh, all of them are really aware of this because especially if you look on the glacier, I would say it's very, very easy to see that something is, is happening. Also in a village with water, maybe it's not getting warmer, but something going on with the weather for sure. So for us, it's been a natural thing to, to do what we can to work sustainable. And we've been to keep, uh, having some priority areas to try to do the best we can. Indeed, climate change can no longer be ignored. According to a latest landmark report, at least a third of the glaciers in the Hindu Kush Himalayan ranges will melt by the year 2100 due to climate change. This, even if carbon emissions are dramatically cut and we succeed in limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Thus, this is the best case scenario. And if the emissions are not cut, the law soars to two-third glaciers melting. The glaciers are a critical water store for the 250 million people who live in the Hindu Kush Himalayan region. And these people rely on the great rivers that flow from the peaks into India, Pakistan, China and other nations. The report is the combined effort of researchers and policy experts from 22 countries and has been compiled by International Centre for Integrated Mountain Development based in Kathmandu. Climate change has dominated several international meetings. The issue also reverberated in the Yellow West protests that are on in France. So French can make good decisions to stop um, a lot of things they are used to do and be a good uh, uh, example for other countries not to go this way because this is, an, um, this is a way where it's a U-turn necessary. This latest report most importantly puts the focus on the Hindu Kush Himalaya that had earlier received less attention than other places despite being far more populous. The Hindu Kush Himalaya are spread over 3,500 kilometers from Afghanistan in the west to Myanmar in the east. The region is often called the world's third pole as it contains the most ice outside of the Antarctic and Arctic regions. The region is also crucial as it controls the monsoon system, which South Asia relies on for most of its rainfall. Until recently, the impact of climate change on the ice in Hindu Kush Himalaya region was uncertain. But we really do know enough now to take action. And the action is urgently needed. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha TV. And that's all in this edition of World Panorama. But we leave you with the visuals of celebrations seen on Tuesday on the Chinese New Year. And people not just from China and the neighboring countries, but far away, Americans also welcomed the year of the pig. A spectacular light shows and lanterns illuminated parts of China on the first day of the Lunar New Year, adding a festive and uh, enchanting atmosphere. In the U.S., uh, pig-themed products were paraded by the top U.S. brands to celebrate Chinese New Year. So take a look at uh, the Lunar New Year celebrations. I'll see you next week with another episode of World Panorama. Bye-bye.